Hello and a very warm welcome to Policy Watch, our weekly program that keeps you abreast of all the major economic developments during the week. Well, it's been a very eventful week this time. Monday we saw the deal with Iran and on Friday we ended with GDP numbers for the second quarter. In between we saw the government stuff in its stand on the issue of agricultural subsidies to be discussed at the forthcoming talks of the 9th Ministerial of the WTO to be held at Bali, Indonesia. And to discuss these stories we have with us Subir Gokharan, Head of Research at Brookings India. Welcome to the show Subir. Thank you. Well, second quarter GDP numbers that were released on Friday did not bring much cheer. Though the overall GDP growth at 4.8% was a tad better than the previous quarter's 4.4%, the prospect of attaining 5% growth in the current fiscal now looked definitely more remote. Remember, reaching that 5% number means we'll have to clock an average of approximately 5.5% in the next six months. And that looks highly unlikely when juxtaposed with the 4.6% that we achieved in the first half. We'll ask Subir if he's more hopeful, but first let's hear this bureau report. The Indian economy has shown only marginal improvement during July to September this year as agriculture and construction activities recorded higher growth. On the back of a good monsoon, the agriculture sector, which also includes forestry and fisheries, grew by 4.6%. Higher growth in agriculture sector will help policy makers to control persistently high food inflation. While financing, insurance, real estate and business services recorded a growth rate of 10%, community, social and personal services grew by 4.2%. However, the fragility of economic recovery is reflected in the negative growth of the mining and quarrying sectors. Another important barometer of economic activity, the manufacturing sector, grew at a dismal rate of just 1% over the growth recorded during the same period last year. Production of coarse cereals, pulses and oil seeds is expected to grow by 4.9%, 1.9% and 14.9% respectively during the Kharif season this fiscal. Revival of the real estate sector has resulted in good demand for cement and finished steel. While production of cement recorded a healthy growth of 5.9%, consumption of finished steel grew by 1.3% during July to September this year. Another important economic indicator, the sale of commercial vehicles, recorded a negative growth of 22.1% during this period. The country's gross domestic product or GDP had expanded by 4.4% in the April to June quarter of this fiscal and 5.2% in July to September quarter last fiscal. Krishnanand Tripathi's report for Rajya Sabha TV. Well, Supir, how did you look at the numbers? Do you see them as the glass half full? Have we, is the recovery happening? Have we bottomed out? Or does it mean that we're in for trouble times ahead? I think uh, I, my sense was that we were hitting the bottom you know, with the last two or three quarters and that has been reinforced by the number being slightly better than the last quarter. Uh, we had 4.4 uh, uh, in Q1, we have 4.8 in Q2 and the main drivers of that are uh, agriculture uh, showing a recovery from 2.7 to 4.6 percent uh, and manufacturing actually moving from a negative 1.2 to 1 percent so it's a 2 percent swing there. Uh, that seems to be mostly or significantly because okay. of the export revival that we've had in this quarter sure, so that's sure. I think a positive sort of signal that the mm -hmm. Uh, rupee depreciation is starting mm. to pay off in terms mm -hmm. of you know revival at least for mm. some sectors. Uh, what I want to emphasize though is the investment number. Mm. You know the investment to GDP ratio is a, to my mind a very critical number and when we look at our growth performance between say the late 90s and the early 2000s mm. we were growing at roughly 5 percent during that period. Our investment to GDP mm. ratio was 25 percent. Mm. Uh, in our high growth phase, it swung dramatically upwards and peaked out at around 38%. Yeah, yeah. For the last four quarters, and I have our, our mm. last uh, two quarters for this year and comparable quarters for last year, we have 32.6% and 33.6%. And in the co com corresponding quarter of last year, 33.8 and 34.6%. So even though we're growing at 5% or below, we still are investing uh, almost a third of our GDP. But why isn't this Which investment means, translating into growth? Yes, that's, the, that's the key. Mm. So this is both the opportunity mm. and the, the challenge. Mm -hmm. The opportunity is that because you're creating this capacity anyway, I mean, you mm. know, around the buzzes, mm. nobody's investing, there isn't enough incentive, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of problems. But the numbers suggest that there is some investment going on. So capacity is being created. And what that suggests is that if you were to re resolve some of the constraints, that you mm -hmm. could get a fairly quick kind of a recovery, not a great dramatic change, but some step up in the growth 
even without uh, you know fundamental changes taking place the challenge is that this seems to reflect an imbalance mm -hmm. that capacities have been created in some sectors mm -hmm. but not across the board so that okay. you know you have a binding constraint which prevents capacity from being fully utilized even though it's been created and i think the important example in that uh, regard is the power sector mm -hmm. where we've had so much capacity created mm -hmm. in the last 5 years and to a point where sure. theoretically we we could be you know generating power power, huh? power surplus or power sufficient but we haven't done it with coal so power plants that were dependent on the domestic coal supplies being being uh, increased are running at relatively low uh, utilization plant load factors okay. which means money has been spent assets mm -hmm. have been have been created but they're not being used fully which is why the growth numbers are looking so sluggish and i think that's a problem that we or a challenge that we have to address as we go along would that be true of across sectors yes power of course is a very classic example yes, where you yes. have the capacity but yeah. you don't have the fuel linkages right. so you're not able to utilize that yeah. but would that be true of across I, sectors I think, because I mean, if that were really true yeah. i mean then you if capacity is being created then you would not see this kind of high inflation also because of course barring food where you have the everywhere else also there is a feeling that we're supply constrained yeah. and that is why you've had I inflation think the, the supply constraint picture is also reflecting this unevenness okay. Uh, so you know food for example in agriculture mm -hmm. we have 4.6% growth mm -hmm. which should suggest supplies are abundant and mm -hmm. you know inflation should come down but we also had a, a huge surge in food prices particularly rice mm -hmm. you know the the uh, the kharif crop mm -hmm. the rice is the predominant kharif mm -hmm. crop 4.6% growth in agriculture means that rice production should have been mm -hmm. you know driving this of course we'll see that in the in the third quarter as well but uh, at the same time rice prices have been rising over this period for about at about 18 19% so clearly you know there is some uh, something else going on is not just simple supply and demand and there i think uh, speaking more broadly about agriculture is this imbalance in investments i think is also mm -hmm. causing a problem uh, production may be increasing but storage transportation mm -hmm. distribution all of those factors seem to not have kept pace with the kind of uh, you know requirement that we have so i think there are a number of sectors okay. transportation i think is very critical because okay. the highway program has mm. sort of you know hit a roadblock mm. literally mm. Uh, linking roads mm. uh, that link up uh, mm. getting out of a city for example these mm. days is an ordeal because the, it's congestion mm. you know to an extreme no, because there you have to the solve highway. the issue really of you know user charges if yeah. people are not going to be willing to pay for the price right. of using a highway and you want to build the ask the private sector to come and build the highway yeah. what do you do but speaking of agriculture you spoke of the number of reasons why food prices are rising and this is an issue we'll return to subsequently also part of the reason also is because of mismanagement of the food economy government has been raising procurement prices yeah. and stocking so much much in excess of the buffer stock right. because of the food security act so that's a big issue in agriculture but speaking of agriculture performance the second quarter reflects 4.6% which seems very good but is it also that would you think that must everybody is attributing this higher growth to the good abundant monsoon so are we back to the earliest days days when india was predominantly dependent on the rain gods because we were so the entire gdp was really driven by agriculture so now are we back to that state because industry is hardly growing manufacturing which is where we need to really see growth to have jobs that is also at 1% yes it's better than a negative figure but it's still much too low so are we going back to the earlier days where agriculture is again the main prop of the economy no i don't think so i think agriculture as a share of gdp is now significantly less than it was 10 or 20 years ago so sure. it's you know about 14 15% so even if it grows very rapidly the contribution it makes to overall growth is is limited secondly the rural economy itself has diversified okay. considerably there are many more things going on in the rural economy than mm -hmm. Uh, outside of agriculture okay. so there is i think a complexity that has come into this relationship mm -hmm. which is you know it doesn't make that not captured in the numbers so perhaps okay but very clearly if mm -hmm. we have a bad monsoon mm -hmm. uh, it spills over into many other things including for example you know uh, the the procurement or the purchase of mm -hmm. of uh, agriculture equipment tractors mm -hmm. things like that and also because wage uh, rates go down mm -hmm. or the demand for labor is not mm -hmm. that great the lower end uh, fast moving consumer goods also get impacted so the linkages i think are much greater uh, the issue here is uh, even as agriculture is showing the surge mm. even a good monsoon is giving us a more abundant crops 
why is why are food, food prices price. not coming down? I think that's the fundamental challenge which uh, we don't seem to be getting to grips with. Now. Absolutely, but at the same time, is it also the issue that you know, because even though we are seeing such good growth in agriculture, unless we see faster growth <coughs> in other two sectors also, we will really never reach because, as you said, agriculture share in GDP is so low, so we will never reach that seven eight percent of at GDP. All. Mm -hmm. So and then, yeah. how what does one do to get manufacturing in particular? A kickstart. We have a natural manufacturing policy, I think but the sort of solutions are very straightforward. Uh, let's look at the interest rates, for example. Uh, the reason why interest rates are high and are likely to get even higher, if you know that's the trajectory, is because inflation is so high. If so, food prices don't come down, inflation is not going to come down, whatever else you do. So we really have to tackle inflation you, you first. Have to tackle okay, inflation. so on that note, Subir, I'll have to interrupt you because we're going to slip into a very short break, but we'll be back very soon, so please do stay with us. Welcome back. The Midnight Accord with Iran in Geneva between Iran, the United States, China, Russia, France, Britain and Germany could be a game changer for India. Apart from the implications for geopolitics, it could have major consequences for the Indian economy. India imports about 80% of its oil needs and refiners are the biggest purchasers of foreign currency. A reduction in the oil import bill and a call of fall in oil prices could help rein in the current account deficit and also reduce the pressure on the rupee. We'll ask Subir for his take on how he thinks this deal could impact the economy. But first, let's hear this bureau report. First time in a decade, we've halted the progress on Iran's nuclear program. A midnight accord between U.S. lead global powers and Iran to curb Iran's nuclear program is expected to have a positive effect on India. Indian currency rose the most among other major Asian currencies on the hopes of a fall in crude prices following the nuclear deal between Iran, the United States, China, Russia, France, Britain and Germany. The deal to halt militarization of Iran's nuclear program that will also roll back some of its bomb-making capabilities has already reduced the tensions and rhetoric in the Middle East. Following the deal, Brent crude fell by 2.2% on Monday. The deal came amid the reports that Reserve Bank will be extending dollar purchase window for oil market companies, reducing demands for dollars in currency markets. The rupee strengthened in response to these developments, closing at Rs 62.5 against the greenback on Monday. There is an additional advantage for India as it has rupee trade agreement with Iran for payment of oil imports. The deal gives India flexibility to import more oil from Iran and make payment in Indian currency, thereby reducing pressure on rupee. The finer details of the deal are not yet known and reports suggest that Iran might not be allowed to increase its supplies. But general expectation is that prices will fall over the next few months. India is a net importer of crude oil and meets 80% of its requirement by importing crude oil. A reduction in the oil import bill and account of a fall in global oil prices could help rein in the current account deficit and reduce the pressure on the rupee. A slowing economy has reduced non-oil imports but oil imports are up 3.3% year-on-year during the April to October period. India was forced to slash its oil imports from Iran due to stringent sanctions imposed by the West. Iran was the second largest source of oil for India after Saudi Arabia but was reduced to the sixth position due to sanctions. That situation can now very well change to India's advantage. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, so we, could it be a game changer for us or is it that the nitty gritty, the finer details are yet not known and actually if you look at the whatever details have come out, it's not as if Iran can sell any more oil. It's just that the fear of that they, you know, it could be prevented from selling even the existing amount, that has disappeared. So are we really kind of counting our chickens before they hatch or well, is I there reason to the, be? The, the, the two factors that you mentioned in your introduction, one that there is, this is going to contribute to a greater perception of stability in the region, the sort of uh, the, the red alert in a sense may have sca been scaled down a little bit or significantly depending on you know how this uh, this process moves forward and that is it in itself going to have an impact on oil prices across the board. The second is that uh, even though you know we have been forced to diversify our uh, purchases mm -hmm. away from Iran given yeah. the sanctions, mm -hmm that Iran is proximate, the cost of transportation of oil from there yes, to much, India much, much yes. lower. So you're going to, if you can get more oil or stay where you are, you're actually going to save on, on overall cost Absolutely. of mm -hmm. imports. So both of these are positive. 
Uh, I think you've got to look at it uh, with a little bit of caution because this is only the beginning of a uh, mm. process of, of yeah, uh, six months. We're going to watch and see how Iran uh, complies. Uh, as that process gains momentum and provides more confidence to both sides, uh, we might see some stability. But I think taking a longer term view on energy and its impact mm -hmm. on India's balance of payments, uh, there is some positive news there and that mm -hmm. comes essentially from the fact that the U.S. with its uh, very rapid uh, you know, growth in, mm -hmm. its, in domestic supplies, mm -hmm. uh, global oil or global okay. energy supply demand balances are going to change quite significantly. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at oil prices mm -hmm. three years from now or five mm -hmm. years from now, mm -hmm. Uh, there are, I think, reasonable forecasts that suggest that they will be actually, certainly in real terms and perhaps even in nominal terms, which means in actual dollar values, be significantly less than what they are today. So if we're looking ahead, this is one source of vulnerability that mm -hmm. I think is perhaps starting to, to abate. And that's obviously very positive, both from the current account side of viewpoint and the implications for the rupee. That doesn't mean we have to stop exploring our own uh, you know, exploring our own reserves, our own resources mm -hmm. and trying to bring them to commercial production as quickly as possible. That's the strategy that we have mm -hmm. to follow. But the energy scenario overall, uh, notwithstanding the Iran uh, development, uh, is looking rather positive, or relatively positive over the next, over the medium to long term. I think that for us is a okay. big relief because our energy consumption over this period is going to uh, accelerate quite rapidly. So, but then would this be an appropriate juncture, like if, you exp if everybody expects international oil prices to fall, would this be an appropriate juncture for the government to go whole hog and go in for complete oil deregulation, especially diesel, LPG, kerosene, all the petroleum products which are currently subsidized at huge yeah. cost to the exchequer, if today if prices fall, because then consumers will feel, okay, if I'm going to pay less, what's wrong with market pricing? So is the government somewhere missing out on that opportunity to do well, so? Well, I think the, the the opportunity was really missed when oil prices were uh, 38 40 dollars a barrel in the aftermath of the crisis and then they very quickly shot up to 80 and then 100 and in that window was not exploited but uh, the long term prospect yes i think gives us as i said it certainly has a bearing in the current account and if the government is to use the opportunity to start to scale back on its subsidies it effectively could be a big uh, help to fiscal consolidation as well the question is the time frame and mm -hmm. the time frame that the government has vis-a-vis -vis its own political calculations versus the time frame that you know shale oil 2017 or so so still got some time and we'll we'll have a new government with a new horizon and so on so opportunity certainly arises i think it, it should be possible to think in terms of uh, of letting the, uh, the the upward adjustment happen and not mm -hmm. necessarily you know fully passing on the downward adjustment but uh, I think the, uh, that's, that's a matter of detail. Uh, but the, the medium to long term opportunity on energy, I think, is um, of the, all the things in the global uh, uh, radar screen, uh, seems to be among the more positive uh, prospects. Okay. And as far as rupee payments with Iran are concerned, on the one hand, there is this argument that really Iran does not require the rupee so much because they don't import very much from India apart from tea. Right. So how much can you push the rupee payment uh, argument, uh, number one? You can't one? in the current situation. Okay. What you need to do is to back it up with a very aggressive push for exports. Now, what okay. do the Iranians want that we can give them mm -hmm. so that you effectively have a barter kind of, uh, so that the rupee settlement happens? Uh, they don't have a similar problem with the other East Asian countries because they import enormous quantities of, of uh, merchandise from mm -hmm. there but we have not uh, you know we've not played a very important role so people are suggesting various things like project mm -hmm. you know services project yes. oriented services mm -hmm. uh, so maybe there's an opportunity to to do this double push okay. this is boost indian exports mm -hmm. at the same time create the conditions necessary for a viable rupee uh, settlement mechanism okay. uh, and i think you know it's worth exploring both of these but if you're looking longer term, mm -hmm. uh, the flip side that I want to point mm -hmm. out is that if energy prices globally come down, mm -hmm. then the reserves that we have onshore and offshore mm -hmm. may become economically unviable okay. because the costs of extracting them mm -hmm. may be higher than what the global price uh, settles at. So that is a double, a bit of a, okay. a, a double-edged sword. Yeah. Okay, so one doesn't know which way it will turn. Yeah. But anyway, on that note, so we will take a small little break, but we'll be back very soon. So please do stay with us. Welcome back. 
Will the 9th ministerial of the WTO, the World Trade Organization at Bali, from 3rd to 6th December, really hate, hurt the interests of Indian farmers, especially small farmers? The agreement on agriculture, one of the most contentious WTO agreements, is slated to come up for discussion at the ministerial. With India waving the red flag against any talk of a peace clause or any temporary waiver against the imposition of penalties in case we cross the permissible cap of 10% on agricultural subsidies, it is highly unlikely that the talks will make any headway. But if we leave aside the issue of not succumbing to pressure from developed countries, is there a case really for scrapping agricultural subsidies for domestic rather than external reasons? We'll ask Subir for his views, but first let's hear this bureau report. According to some reports, concluding the Doha round is not a goal of this meeting, but to finalize some key elements. These are trade facilitation, agriculture and duty-free quota-free market access for the least developed countries. The United States has made clear that these issues need to be considered as a package. So failure to agree on any one issue will likely lead to failure on all three issues. An agreement on trade facilitation is expected to produce the most significant economic benefits for all WTO members. It could increase global gross domestic product by close to $1 trillion annually. Such an agreement would improve the efficiency and remove complex custom procedures and high costs associated with the transnational movement of goods. However, for India, any negotiation on agriculture subsidies is very crucial. This includes new disciplines on export subsidies and tariff rate quotas for agriculture. Food export control is another issue under discussion. Rising food prices from 2006 to 2008 and the use of export controls by some countries in response had resulted in global undersupply of agricultural products, contributing to increasing global food prices and highlighting the need for a multilateral solution to this issue. Some WTO members like US, Canada and Pakistan have already raised concerns over India's ambitious food security law that seeks to provide highly subsidized food grains to nearly two-thirds of India's population. Some members have red flagged the issue as India's stock maintenance requirements might affect global supply of food grains and some other have raised questions on subsidies to its farmers. India has made it clear that successful implementation of its food security law is very important for India's poor and maintaining proper stock for a rain-fed country like India is very important for its food aid program. India also highlighted the importance of ensuring minimum returns to her farmers so that they are able to produce enough for themselves and for food security program. As for WTO discussions, the domestic subsidy to agriculture sector should not cross the limit of 10% of total production. Government sources maintain that India will not succumb to pressure from developed countries. It will continue to press for changes in the WTO's agriculture pact to raise the cap on subsidies. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Well, Subir, the entire controversy, I think, is clearly an offshoot of what we were discussing earlier, the Food Security Act and what it has meant in terms of food procurement, what it has meant in terms of the possibility of subsidies shooting sky high, well beyond perhaps the 10 percent that WTO cap imposes. Would you agree that there's really a case for scrapping these subsidies, not because of external pressure, but merely because of the domestic impediments, you know, I mean, the imperatives rather? I, I don't, I think there's always a case for a safety net when it comes to basic access okay. to food, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just survival uh, requirements. But to think in terms of a, a, a food security mechanism that theoretically 67 covers of the population. 67 percent, to me, that's, that's not, uh, you know, very desirable. The, the safety net aspect of it is, mm -hmm. is completely acceptable and, you know, you try and do it as efficiently as you can. Uh, but the spread has, I think, had some Im impact on and will have some impact as it goes along on the choice, f choice of cultivation. What, what crops are farmers going to grow? One of the reasons we've had such severe problems with food inflation is because not enough of what people are eating is being cultivated. And the reason for that is that mm. since the government guarantees uh, a market for a purchase of certain crops, mm. rice and wheat being the predominant ones, it doesn't matter the farmer whether the consumer is consuming this or not. So you're distorting the price It is signals. distorting the choice of uh, the farmer in terms of land allocation, mm -hmm. in terms of what to grow mm -hmm. in what season. And so that is, I think, depriving the opportunity for other crops mm -hmm. to respond to market signals. Okay. Uh, when prices of, of vegetables go mm -hmm. up, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent a year, mm -hmm. 
you would expect that somewhere a farmer says, hey, this is a market opportunity, sure, let's do it. Sure. I want to just give the example of Guar, uh, since it's related to energy. We've seen, you know, Guar has now become, gum has now become India's largest agricultural Absolutely. export. It has become India's largest single merchandise export to the US. And where, you know, who is doing anything to this? It just it was a pure and simple response to market forces because the demand in the US went up uh, for their fracking requirements. So why aren't we seeing similar opportunities or similar responses uh, to price signals coming from the market? And I think that's where this whole issue of, you know, if the government is to come and step mm -hmm. in, you know, stand in the middle, mm -hmm. it tends to distort. So it's a dual problem, which is one is that you're trying to justify this or defend this in terms of the international position. At the same time, you, since you want food inflation to come down, the best way to bring food inflation down theoretically is to allow free trade. Absolutely. Uh, you, can, you can start, in, if, if for example, we allowed free trade in, in pulses, in tur dal or arar dal, which have also been uh, you know, uh, subject to inflation pressures, maybe other countries will start growing this exclusively to and the, the irony really country. is that the other key item to be discussed at Bali is trade facilitation, which will really benefit us hugely. But because the WTO has this all or nothing kind of you know, clause, yeah. as it were, that you agree to everything or nothing at all, India's insistence on, you know, on, this, on the food subsidies aspect is likely to jeopardize the entire talks itself. So does it make sense for the government to say, no, no, we're going to kind of stick to our stand on food subsidies and we want our own interpretation to stay? Or is that only a stance that they're taking, you think, at the negotiating table, India will be a little bit more flexible? Well, I think the, the main uh, point of contention is the four-year limit, the four which, year is, limit which is that if, if there is no agreement mm. today, uh, the provision or the, the, the permissibility of subsidies mm. is to be, you know, is sunsetted out yes. after four years. India's position is that if we don't reach an agreement, we should not remove this clause. Not. So, in, in, on the face of it, that's not that's not unreasonable proposition. Okay. That you know, until we have something concrete, okay. let's not do away with what we're already doing. But at the same time, it is creating the opportunity to, in a sense, perpetuate the image uh, of India uh, as a spoiler. Uh, uh, okay. Not just that, but even domestically, okay. to sure. perpetuate a regime okay. which actually is having domestic the, consequences. Oh, okay. And I think okay. that's the trade-off which we've <laughs> got to be conscious of. Okay, Sumi, yeah. thank you so much for being with us. We've thank come you. to the end of this very nice program and very nice discussion. But before we close, let's take a look at the quick takeaways. Well, to start with, as far as GDP is concerned, Subir feels that it is these numbers do show signs of some kind of bottoming out of the economy because the numbers are definitely better than the first quarter. As far as the Iran deal is concerned, he spoke about how the dramatic change is as a result of the U.S. self-sufficiency oil is going to give us an opportunity, if perhaps to try and deregulate oil prices, but it's not going to be easy in today's circumstances, given the political imperatives. As far as the WTO talks are concerned, Subir is entirely in agreement that, yes, it is the domestic imperatives that should drive the need for removing food subsidies so that price signals really go through to the farmer and the farmer responds to these price signals and we go the right kind of crops. With that, we come to the end of this program. Thank you so much for being with us. But we'll be back next week, same time. Thank you so much from all of us at RST.